screen at least? Sure. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you see the full screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I can see the, uh, this is a cracked model. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks, Vidim, for inviting me for in this lecture. And it's really an honor to speak to everyone here about efficient quantum verification approaches. As Vidim told, told everyone, introduce me. I'm a traditional verification, hardware verification validation person. And uh, we're trying to see how we can employ those approaches for quantum circuits. And that's how what the talk is about. So let me go to the next. So this is an outline of my talk. So first, let me introduce the problems. So the quantum computing we all know it's the next big thing, right? So a lot of big players like Microsoft, IBM, Google, INQ, uh, Amazon, Rigetti, and AQT, all are actually uh, trying to develop their own quantum computing models. In fact, IBM, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, they have IBM's uh, quantum computers we actually use in our research. And I believe Amazon Bracket also a lot of people use. And these startups like AKT, Rigetti, and IMQ, they are also developing their own quantum computers. And I believe, it's my personal belief again, that uh, quantum computers are going to be the next big thing, like what machine learning was in the early 2010s or late 2000s. I think quantum computing will reach that that era uh, very soon. So we are, at, we are trying to get to that era. So... What is the advantage of quantum computing? Quantum computing provides exponential improvements in the best case for re many reasons, like integer factorization in polynomial time, which can break the current internet RSA cryptography, which depends on factorizing a large uh, component number, which is comprised of two prime uh, factors. So there are various further application domains where quantum computing are used, like nature, optimization, finance, machine learning, and so on. Now, the quantum computing roadmaps, we, we see IBM had developed this roadmap from 2019 to 2026. This is Rigetti's roadmap. And if you see IMQ's roadmap, they have a definite plan that by 2028, they will have a 1,000 qubit quantum computer, right? So we are actually, we are seeing that people are taking up challenges and we are going to an era where quantum computing will be a big mainstream and uh, a lot of people will be using that and we need to prepare ourselves for that. So what is the challenges of quantum computing? So I was, as I was telling you, quantum computers are publicly available on different platforms like superconducting quantum computers like IBM, Google, and Rigetti, trapped and quantum computer by Quantinium, INQ, et cetera. Uh, quantum annular led D wave machines and other technical routes for Microsoft and Intel. So, quantum advantage, as we said, showed huge potential for accelerating classical computing, right? Like, for example, integer factorization using Schwarz algorithm. Now, quantum transpilation is required for the physical implementation of quantum algorithms. Now, physical quantum circuits might look drastically different from logical quantum circuits, and we will explain shortly why this is the case. So it's definite, therefore, it's critical to prove the correctness of the employed quantum circuit. So you need to make sure that the circuit you're finally employing is actually doing functionally correct, like it's doing the, the actual task that it is supposed to do. And therefore, quantum circuit sequence checking proves two circuits are equivalent, and that's what we are going to discuss in today's talk, okay? So before we go into more detail, let's go get some background on quantum computing. So quant computers today, as you can see, uh, we have computers almost everywhere. In fact, one of the things that I always talk about when I talk with my undergrad students is that if you drive a car which was built in the last five to 10 years, that has more electronic or computing products than mechanical components, right? Which is an amazing thing because car, we always think about auto an automobile as a mechanical component. We think it as a cyber physical component these days. So com computers are almost everywhere, right? From your traffic signal to your coffee machine, to your cell phones, to your trains, credit cards, everywhere. Now, computers today, we all know, work on a binary fashion, zero or one, like an on and off switch. Now, let's look at what does that imply in terms of the states of a system. So if you have two inputs, the number of states you can get is four. If you have three inputs, the number of states is eight. If you have 300 inputs, the number of cases is 200, 10 raised to 90, right? So this is huge. If you have 300 inputs, the number of cases 10 raised to 90 is huge. For comparison, the number of atoms in the universe is approximately 10 raised to 17. So you can clearly see that the number of cases rises exponentially compared to the number of atoms in the universe. Now, quantum computing works by both zero and one, as you will shortly see in the next slide. Like it has the probability of being either in zero or in one state. So all results can be possible at the same time. 
right? And therefore, this causes an exponential number of states which is very difficult to manage in quantum computing compared to classical states. Classical, we already saw, it's it, it 10 raised to 90 is already difficult. Now quantum is even more, so it's, it becomes exponentially difficult. So measurement only gives you one possible result. So quantum computing at the output, you can get all the possible results at the same time. However, there's a probability of which results can appear more. So for many application, not all, tricks are exist to increase the probability of desired results. If you want any desired result, there are tricks like through amplitude amplification and so on, by which uh, you can actually uh, you can actually increase the probability of the desired out. Now, quantum bits or qubits are the basic units of quantum computing, just similar to normal bits that are basic units for classical computing. Now, qubits can perform computations by using quantum superposition and entanglement, where psi is mentioned as alpha 0 and plus beta 1, where alpha and beta are probability, probabilities whether the qubit will be in state 0 or 1 respectively, right? So, the, of course, the, since the final probability should be 1, so alpha square plus beta square is obviously 1. And quantum circuits integrates qubits and quantum gates to perform computations. So we have several quantum gates. We have Hadamard gates, we have X gates, we have CX gates, we have um, Toffoli gates and so on. So these gates are in combination of these gates, we form a quantum computation, right? This You can think of this as an analogy to classical computation when you have AND gates, OR gates and so on. Now, let's look at what is the state of quantum computing if we look at an analogy to classical conventional computers. So if we look back in time, initially our regular computers, the computer that, I, that I'm presenting, or if you are looking at it through your cell phone, that's a very small computer, right? But initially we didn't have that advantage. If you look at this picture, this was the type of computer that IBM used to work on. These are the huge computers that IBM used to work on. And Believe me when I say this, these computers had much less processing capabilities compared to your cell phones right now. So we used to have these bulky quantum, bulky computers, which we have in like the bulky quantum computers right now. Then we had Moore's law, a digital revolution, which reduced the size. And then we have the usable computers right now. Like those days, computers were not mainstream, right? Like if you encounter any person who grew up in the 70s and 80s, they probably would not be using com computers for anything. Like forget internet or social media or any of these things, they wouldn't be using computers for data processing or writing a document or something. People would be handwriting or using a typewriter. But things improve. Now we have these small scale quantum computers. You can literally write a paper in your cell phone. You can, you can uh, use your computers for various computational applications and so on. One of the things that we have to appreciate and we have to acknowledge the success of this is through EDA software. So EDA or electronic design software are used to handle problems with enormous complexity. So overall, a design supply chain has many EDA software. So it's used for designing, for verification, for synthesis, for uh, layout, for placement and routing, for testing, for validation, for fabrication and everything, right? So these EDA tools built on several strong algorithms like divide and conquer, uh, A star and so on. These have been used for various purposes. Like for example, we use diffusion diagrams for verifying whether a normal, and again, I'm talking about normal uh, hardware right now, not uh, quantum hardware. We have to verify whether two circuits are equivalent or not. We, have, we are using this uh, A star algorithm for layout and synthesis. We have to do a synthesis algorithm to co convert a Verilog code to an R or an RPL to a necklace, right? We need to know like the each statements and the for statements you write in Verilog cannot be, how do we realize them in terms of flip-flops and AND gates? That's why we use these algorithms, right? And they use SAT solvers, integer linear programming and so on. So EDA tools are form a core method of hardware development. Like if you point moment imagine that these EDA companies go away like Synopsis, Cadence and Metagraphics which is Siemens right now go away no EDA company like ANSYS nothing exists right now then it will be very difficult for your Apples or Intels or AMDs or NVIDIAs to uh, to actually uh, am I still audible? Zidin I suddenly saw the panel go away hello Zidin can you unmute and let me know if I'm audible Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, sorry. Somehow the panel went away and I was a little surprised. Sorry. Sorry, where I was getting back. So if you imagine for a moment these EDA companies going away, like Synopsis, uh, uh, Mentor, Cadence, and ANSYS, all of these go away. 
then will it be possible for Intel's and AMD's and NVIDIA's to build such classic hardware that we are looking at? Will Apple be able to make your new iPhone? No, right? So all these things, these CPU trends that we are seeing that increasing, a big role is played by the EDA tools. So, so therefore, we definitely need the EDA tools for developing state-of-the-art new hardware, right? I wanted this slide, I diverted from quantum computing and I wanted to emphasize the role of EDA tools because that's what we are going to use in quantum computing and that's what I'm going to emphasize right now. So in, in quantum computers, as I said, we are in the similar sense. So we have to have a more powerful designer compilation tool. So if you see here, this diagram on the right, this is exactly how our traditional EDA design flow is. And we need to develop the same flow for quantum computers. If we don't develop these, then our quantum computers will be there, but we will not know how to use them. So we may end up in a situation where we have quantum computers, but no efficient methods to use or design them, okay? So therefore, we definitely need to develop new EDA algorithms for quantum computing. In fact, I would go on to say that quantum EDA is a very important problem that more researchers should be interested in and should be invested in. So moving on, quantum circuit simulation is, is a, one of the biggest problem because right now the quantum uh, computers we have are not ready, right? Like for example, if you want to simulate on a thousand qubit machine, you don't have a thousand qubit machine to run your program. You can only simulate that, right? So if you have a quantum simulator, how can you run a quantum simulator? So either you can use a classical simulation based approach using cascade circ or any of these methods, or you can use a decision diagram based simulation, which is a more formal simulation. But of course, that's not scalable because formal methods again suffer from state space explosion, similar to classical cases. Now, two of the things that are very important in quantum computers, which are which do not have a proper analogy in a classical computer are logic synthesis and layout synthesis. We have a logic synthesis in classical computation, where as I was mentioning, you have to convert the um, RTL to netlist, but in quantum computer, it's a bit different. So when you have a logical quantum circuit and you have to map it on a classical computer quantum circuit, then there, the, sorry, but when you have to map it to a, a physical quantum circuit, you have to look at the limitations of the physical quantum circuit, right? The physical quantum circuit, circuit might have several gates it's like, for example, the IBM Sherbrooke computer has the gate library of ECR, IDRZ, SX, and X. No, so you have to decompose the logical quantum circuit to map it to the physical quantum circuit, right? So that uh, the corresponding gate libraries are mapped correctly, okay? So you have to ensure, because for example, if you have only, like remember your undergraduate digital circuits or digital design class, we were all taught that NAND and NOR gate are the universal gate, right? You can convert any circuit to a NAND or NOR gate equivalent. This is something similar. So if you have only NAND and NOR gates, you cannot use any other like XOR or any other gates. Similarly, you have layout synthesis. You have to, uh, like two qubit gates can only be executed on the connected physical qubit. So the physical qubits are far away from each other. You need swap gates to perform the routing algorithm for the physical com computation, right? So logical and layout synthesis are two very important steps in quantum uh, compilation, quantum translation that is actually, that will be, that is necessary for proper execution of a quantum algorithm. Now, this is where the role of quantum verification comes in. So quantum verification is used to make sure two circuits are functionally equivalent. And let me again get back a little back to the classical verification. So in classical in design flow, like if you work in any hardware company, you will notice that there's a verification flow involved after each step of the EDA design flow. Like for example, when you do a logic synthesis, right? When you do a logic synthesis from the net, RTL to the netlist, how can you ensure that the RTL and the netlist are equivalent, that they are functionally exactly the same? So there's a verification necessary that is done to verify that these two circuits are exactly equivalent, right? Then again, when you convert from the netlist to the layout, there is again a verification process involved to check whether the netlist and the layout are equivalent. In fact, if any of you have ever worked in a, a hardware company, you will know the soft coated saying that for every design engineer, you need to hire four verification engineers. So verification engineer roles are much more prominent in hardware company compared to design role, which is quite not apparent if you have, if you have not worked in a design in a hardware company. But anyway, getting back to quantum computing, so we definitely need this type of verification algorithms to verify whether the algorithm whether the quantum circuits are functionally equivalent once you did a transpilation, right? 
So uh, there are two steps of verification. This is true for both classical and quantum computing. One is formal verification. Formal verification uses mathematics to prove the two circuits are equivalent. It can achieve 100% equivalent certainty. So it can guarantee that two circuits are equivalent. However, the problem is formal verification circuit are not very scalable for larger circuits. In fact, if you see today's uh, hardware, when you, classical hardware, I mean, when you have a system on chips with multiple in, uh, intellectual uh, properties or IPs, these IPs individually can be verified using formal verification, but verifying a complete system on chip using formal verification is almost impossible because it results in something called a state space explosion. On the other hand, simulation-based verification is quite scalable. It puts certain input assignments of stimuli to perform tasks and check the output with the expected value. So basically, you are you, it's like normal verification, like you are putting in some inputs and you are checking the outputs with the interested value, right? So it performs verification by iteratively simulating parts of the quantum circuits and it checks if the subset of the quantum circuit to prove equivalence. Now it is scalable for equivalence checking of larger quantum circuits, definitely, because at the end of the day, you are not doing anything mathematically, you are just putting in input. But the problem is it cannot guarantee 100% circuit equivalence and correctness. The reason is these things blow up again on the input side. So let me give you an example from the classical uh, simulation-based verification. Suppose you are verifying an adder, a very simple adder, which where each input ha has 32 bits, right? So if you have that, then what is the total number of input combinations that you have to apply? You have to apply 2 raised to 32 times 2 raised to 32, that's 2 raised to 64. Now, 2 raised to 64 is a huge number. If you have to apply that many number of inputs, it will take you a long time to verify whether these two circuits are equivalent. And th this is even a simple ladder we are talking about. Things can get even more dangerous, right? So therefore, simulation-based verification is good, but it's, that's the problem. It's not, it doesn't guarantee. So typically, uh, uh, in hardware companies, people get, get up to like a certain desired coverage, like 90, 95% coverage. And then people say that, okay, we are fine. That 5% we don't care about, okay? So uh, to, to look at the background of uh, verification, there are two types of uh, verification that are done, as I was saying, formal and simulation. Now in quantum verification, for formal verification, uh, you have, so in this talk, we will use the words verification and equivalent checking interchangeably. Uh, verification has other connotations in classical hardware verification, but in this talk, we will restrict ourselves to equivalent checking, that is checking the equivalence of two different quantum circuits, as we can see in the picture, okay? Uh, so formal verification is the, uh, can be done using diffusion diagrams, VX calculus, and we proposed our quantum error correction code-based formal verification. And then we have a simulation based where you can use random stimuli generation and special design stimuli generation. So we will look at each of these methods in the next few slides, okay? So let's talk about quantum equivalence checking with VX calculus. So ZX calculus was first proposed to optimize quantum circuit to reduce circuit depth. So ZX calculus is a very interesting method where you uh, rep represent the quantum circuits, the gates using Z or X nodes, uh, and then, then you actually connect them and you do some form of algebraic operation and to reduce the overall state and reduce the states. So Quantum uh, ZS calculus can be used for quantum equivalence checking also as shown by uh, TPM in this paper. The quantum circuit equivalence checking scheme can be converted to this. So basically, if you have two circuits B and U, you take the transpose of U, V, and multiply it with U, and you try to prove that they are, the, the output is an identity. So if two, two circuits are equivalent, the transpose of one, when you multiply with the other circuit, the identity should be an identity. That, that's the whole goal of equivalence checking, okay? So existing research developed equivalence checking using CS calculus, as I was saying, so it, they propose specific categories of quantum circuits that can be verified using CS calculus. So it addresses a problem where the CS calculus shows non-equivalent result because of inaccuracy problem by rounding the numbers close to k pi by 2. So what happens is CS calculus, see if you do some errors, there's a, there's an inaccuracy, like some gates are little inaccurate, then CS calculus Gs calculus is very deterministic. Like if you if there's a little inaccuracy, it will not leave you a way, uh, leave here, right? It's like imagine to for given an analogy, you are cooking and you are given asked to give like an exact amount, let's say k 
2.5 milligram of salt in, for your cooking. Now, if you give 2.55 milligram, that should not be, you should not be uh, fired for that, right? So ZS calculus, on the other hand, is very strict and it, it actually can um, say that the two circuits are non-equivalent if there's some inaccuracy, but these guys provided her an approach by which they could actually detect uh, this. So the CS calculus functions, they wrote from Python to C++-based platform to improve the performance. And uh, taking the equivalence checking of CS calculus, the quantum circuits can be considered equivalent if the resultant circuit equivalence becomes pure words. So basically, the Z and the X gates, as we'll see in the next slide, have, have some sorts of uh, spiders or like circles with some arrows. If those circles go away and if you have pure words, then you mean you know that the circuits are equivalent. However, they showed that such a methodology only applies to Clifford plus T gate quantum circuit equivalence checking, and it is very difficult to verify the other gates. Okay. So then let's uh, uh, let's go on to see how it's done. So equivalence checking with GS calculus can be approached to two methods: one by rewriting the diagram of both circuits into one another, and then uh, the next step is utilizing an equivalence checking meter. To by inverting one diagram, composing the diagrams and simplifying as much as possible. So as you can see, this is the ZS calculus notation, right? The Z gates are written as green circles and the X gates as uh, red. So, and the Hadamard gates as yellow boxes, as you can see. So, uh, so if you can actually, so there are certain rules, as you can see here at the bottom, the A, F, B, C rules. If you can convert a VS, uh, if you can convert the two circuits into these notations, invert one, and then try to simplify them, and finally you get a wire, you know that you, you have a ZS calculus. So, ZS calculus has several rewriting rules. So these type of rewriting rules can be applied to actually simplify. And finally, if you get removed of all these green ovals or circles, whatever you want to call the shapes, and you just end up in words, you know that the two circuits are equivalent. Okay. So now we looked at we look at some of the experimental results that the authors performed. So they did ex extensive experimental uh, the performance of quantum circuit development taken by two different uh, optimization levels in Qiskit. The transpile circuit contains several optimized methods integrated in IBM's transpile method, and the higher optimization levels usually require more time to finish the equivalence checking methods. So ZS calculus method algorithm, it's good, but the next algorithm that we'll talk about, the decision diagram, it's inferior to the decision diagram. That's what they say. Uh, so it's better performance on only highly optimized circuits, while decision diagram package have the opposite performance. Okay, so for equivalent circuits, decision diagram we found out generally outperforms ZS calculus with a speed up of 296 times. For circuits with one get missing, decision diagram outperforms ZS calculus also with a speed up of 199 times. And with, a, uh, and with circuits with inverted C0 gates, decision diagram furnishes a speed up of 1700 times over ZS calculus. Now we will look at what decision diagram based equivalence checking are. Oh, so, Professor. Yes. Uh, so before we come into the decision diagram, uh, would would you mind to answer some questions for the ZS calculus part? I saw there's several questions uh, for the uh, ZS calculus we, part. Can we, the the part. can we take the questions? the questions at the end so that I can maintain? Time? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. That in timekeeping. That's why I. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay, I, I will come back and I will I will answer all the questions. Yes. Yeah. Sorry for interrupt. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So no issues, no issues. Th thanks reading. Thanks for clarification. So anyway, so decision diagram based quantum circuit simulation two can efficiently verify a quantum circuit. So this is exactly similar to ZS calculus. The whole notion: you do a transpose and you invert it, and you multiply with the second circuit. And if the output is an identity, you know that this is up. Uh, this is uh, these two circuits are equivalent. Okay. So then uh, this is a so to give an idea of how this is this works. Let me show you this diagram. So we have two circuits here, G and G prime, right? G comprises of, uh, both comprises of five qubits, uh, both comp and G, G comprises of five quantum gates and uh, G prime com comprises of 19 quantum gates, right? Now, uh, an observation by naked eye cannot give you the an idea that these are equivalent. It's impossible to get that. However, if you do an equivalence checking, so if you see the, here uh, in the diagram in the bottom, let me actually take my laser pointer here so that, can you guys see my laser pointer reading? Can you please reply? Hello? Yes, yes, I can see that. Okay. 
Yeah. So this is the identity, right? Then you apply G1, the first gate, and you get this is the decision diagram you get. Then you apply G1, G1 prime inverse. You have so this is a CS gate, you inverse it, you get this. You get the identity again. So this G1 and G1 prime are both the same gate, so you get the identity again. Then you get G2 and G2 prime. These two are again uh, prime inverse, sorry. Both are same gate, G2 and G2 prime, so you get that again, right? Now G3 is, uh, as you see here, G3 is here, but G, G3 prime is not similar. G3 prime is a Hanuman gate, right? So you don't, so you apply G3 and then you apply all the way from G3 prime to G17 prime and you get an identity. Now G4 you apply and G18, G4 if you see here is an X gate and G18 is also a similar gate. So when you apply here, you get identity. G5 and G19 if you apply, they are also similar, you get the identity, right? So, as well as, so in this way, you can get the identity. Now, uh, one of the, so as well as at each step, you can see when you apply one gate from G and some gate from G prime, you end up getting identity and that's how you prove that these two circuits are equivalent, okay? Now the question that comes is, how will you know which circuits to test for when they're equivalent? Like for example, in this case, we are applying G3 and we're taking all the way from G3 uh, prime inverse to G7 prime inverse, right? How will you smartly know that you have to apply this step? Because for the previous step, you were applying G1 and G1 prime inverse, G2 and G2 prime inverse and so on. So this is a very difficult thing and it's not apparent to how will you know this, just depends on the circuit itself. So the authors here propose three methods uh, to do this. One method is the nice strategy. The nice strategy is you take one gate from each and when one circuit finishes, you apply all the remaining gates, okay? So basically you take G1 and G1 prime inverse. You take G2 and G2 prime inverse. G3, G3 prime inverse. G4, G4 prime inverse. G5, G5 prime inverse. And then G is finished. So G prime has the rest of the gate from G6 to G9, G19. And you apply all the all of them inverse and you get an equivalence, okay? Now, of course, you can clearly understand this is not a very good strategy, right? You are just doing a, a very, uh, uh, how do I say it? It's a, it's a very uh, brute force method, right? So, but like you are taking one at a time and then you are just brute forcing the rest of the gates. Now, we will shortly see this doesn't pop, this method doesn't perform well. This algorithm doesn't perform well. The second method is we call it is a proportional method. The proportional method means you look at the gate proportion of one circuit and the other circuit and you take one at a time. I mean, sorry, you take the similar proportion at a time. Like for example, there are five gates in G and there are 19 gates in G prime, right? So there's one is to four ratio, almost one is to four, right? So then you apply one at a time. So you apply here G1 and G1 prime to G4 prime, G2, G5 prime to G8 prime, G3, G9 prime to G12 prime and so on, okay? So you apply these equivalently and finally you, in this way you will end up all the gates. So there's an equivalent method. This performs well for some approaches, not so well for the other approaches. The third method that uh, the authors proposed is called uh, the look ahead method. The look ahead method is basically you take one gate from G and for the next gate, you decide whether you will take from G prime or G or G and then you perform the operation, okay? The whole idea is you will see how many number of decision diagram nodes. So if you see here, the decision diagrams already have multiple nodes, right? You see whether the number of nodes increase or not. If the number of nodes do not increase, you take that option, okay? And this is called a look ahead option. So basically at each step, you look ahead at both the next steps and take the one which is, which is which have lower. Now the problem with this approach is, uh, the problem with this approach is you're looking at only one step at, in future. Of course, it's better than the previous approaches which was not looking at the future at all. They were, the ninth approach was just doing one at a time and the, the proportional approach was taking just uh, like look, doing a static check, right? Like, okay, one to four ratio at the beginning of the circuit doesn't matter what happens during travel. So it's like you want to go from, for example, from New York to Washington DC, you, you go some step and then you look which route is shorter and then you take that route. That's how we are doing the look ahead approach. So this is the, these are the three approaches as I was mentioning here. So if you see here the number of nodes, if you see for naive approach, it's getting up to seven. For proportional approach also, it's getting up to seven. For the look ahead approach, it's going to seven only for few cases. 
it's just looking which one is lower, right? So it's taking the decision of which one is lower and it's going through that route, okay? Now, looking at the results, uh, they, they found out that for equivalent, the look-ahead strategy outperforms the rest of the methods for equivalent circuits, but the, the two circuits are actually equivalent. So when you are doing an equivalent uh, checking, you have to make, realize that there can be two options. So one option is when both circuits are equivalent. The other option is when one circuit is not equivalent, right? So when both circuits are not equivalent, like if they're different. So if they're equivalent, the look-ahead strategy performs better. The, the look-ahead strategy generates nodes in the range of 182.87 to 4858.317. The look-ahead strategy can verify all circuits with a speed-up of 7.2 times 10 raised to 4 they compared to naive strategy. And for non-equivalent circuit, the look-ahead strategy provides a speed-up of 9 times 10 raised to 4. The proportional strategy is more stable in terms of the number of nodes and complete equivalent checking is more efficient for larger circuits. So if one circuit is small and the other circuit is large, then the proportional strategy can work pretty well. However, if both the circuits are of similar size and are not like a huge margin difference, then the look-ahead strategy performs better. Now, we will talked about formal methods. Let's talk about some time on the simulation-based method, okay? So we will look at the power of simulation in particular checking as was developed by these authors. So all the formal verification can prove with 100% to correctness. It's not very good for, it's not very uh, good for large circuits, right? Because as I said, it will not scale. So simulation based verification strategy can work well when you randomly choose some inputs and you provide them and you see whether the outputs are equivalent or not, okay? So, so to, in the results, we saw that actually they can even can efficiently verify large circuits. The time consumption for simulation does not depend on the whether the circuits are equivalent. So compared to the decision diagram based method for, for simulation based, the speed ups were pretty significant. The largest speed up was obtained was uh, almost 1200 times and the slowest speed up was 2.62 times. So you can clearly see that the simulation based method is much more efficient, right? Uh, so the humans can generally be determined with one to two simulations, which is the primary cause for the speed up. And the simulation based equivalent checking method has poor accuracy because for some circuits, it fails to do that. Now the random stimuli, so stimuli can be generated in two ways. One is random, one is uh, deterministic. Like you can de determine whether the inputs to a circuit, to the two circuits for equivalent checking can be random or whether you want to specifically spend time to craft the specific inputs that will trigger the, whether the two circuits are equivalent or not, right? So there can be two, three types of uh, quantum stimuli proposed to detect errors efficiently. One is classical, one is local quantum, one is global quantum, which we'll describe. The same framework that we described before was used in this case. So the classical stimuli is like binary initialization that you would start with either zero or one. Local stimuli starts with zero, plus or minus states. And the global stimuli requires CX gates on local stimuli to create entanglement with qubits, okay? So when we looked at the results, uh, removing one random gate or adding one random gate, classical stimuli have accuracy of around 86%, and uh, local stimuli have more accuracy, 98.8%. Global stimuli, of course, is a better method, and it will have 99% accuracy. So the probability increases with similar trains by adding or removing two random gates. By adding 10 random Toffoli gates for beginning at beginning or 10 at the end, the accuracy is around 82% for all three. And uh, if we add a gate at the end, the accuracy is 80% uh, for all three. So however, this, these results are not comprehensive. There's much more study necessary to comprehensively identify which random stimuli are better. In fact, I would encourage all the listeners here, if they want to work on this, please work on how we can develop new type of random stimuli. Because in classical hardware, random inputs play a very important role. So random inputs are extremely important for detecting several faults and defects, right? In fact, a lot of our uh, testing of our chips happen through random inputs. Random inputs provide like 60 to 70% of the coverage. Now, stimuli, special design stimuli based detection approaches were also proposed. So simulation checks are performed by initially using different number of binary stimuli. They stimulate the quantum circuit multiple times. And the design stimuli can efficiently perform the matrix detection of TV equals to V where T satisfies these equations, okay? The stimuli will check the element inside the matrix box of T. 
Now, for these extensive uh, stimuli, we also, uh, sorry, the authors also create, uh, did some analysis and they compared with decision diagram based approach. So the average number of simulations required is 3.08 for state of the art. It's 3, 35, uh, 353.09. So time consumed by the simulation varies between 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 to 0.5 seconds. The success rate is pretty good. It provides 100% success rate with the speed up of 48.2 times. The best results are performed for benchmark F51M with 22 qubits and 66 gigabits. Okay. However, the proposed methodology might not cover all possible simuli simuli when additional gates are added. An extensive analysis is needed to develop uh, to see how these methods perform. So one thing I want to again emphasize, these research are still in its infancy. So only one or two papers have been proposed in this. That's why you see me citing only one or two papers. There are tons of other approaches that people can apply. And I would still really encourage everyone listening today to take up these challenges and try to solve, right? So the last part, we'll talk about quantum equivalence checking uh, based on QEC embedding. So the, the traditional decision diagram based method, we found out there are two, uh, uh, three approaches, naive, proportional, and look ahead. Look ahead is good for small circuits of equivalent checking, while proportional strategy is more efficient for larger quantum circuits. However, the proposed strategy does not want, uh, look at the quantum gates, position of quantum gates, or whether there is a QVC or quantum error correction circuit embedded in the quantum circuit, right? So basically what I mean to say is, in the look at strategy, you are looking at immediateness, but not across the whole spectrum, because you have the uh, circuit in your hand. It's not like it's dynamic, the gates are coming dynamically. You have the, it's a static check at the end of the day. So, but you, so you can look ahead, far ahead and take a decision, right? So, so it's challenging to verify quantum circuit with QVC embedding. So in our paper, we actually proposed a strategy. This is this was our paper, and which, which I'm going to talk about. So we used a position mass based strategy. So what we do, we keep, keep an active qubit pool. So we look at the active qubit pool, and depending on the pool, we will propose which which is the next method to go to. So which is the next cube, uh, gate to handle? Okay. So it's basically we are looking into the much into the future rather than looking into the, just the immediate future. And then we are taking a decision based on that. Of course, our method incurs more memory and it might be a little more memory overhead compared when you look at larger quantum circuits. But I would argue saying that verification is done statically and memory is not a big concern as of now. So for the quantum equivalence checking with quantum QC embedding, so if you have a QC embedding circuit, we proposed a graph-based method which, which could actually identify which part is the QC embedding and could cut it out so that we can perform the normal equivalence checking. Okay. So we use the same benchmarks that we use that were used by the authors in the original decision diagram paper. We uh, got maximum of 98% almost uh, uh, acceleration or improvement in, over the look ahead in time and uh, 271 times improvement over proportional strategy in time. There's a 790 times improvement over proportional in the number of decision diagram nodes. So when you're talking about memory, the number of decision diagram nodes is also very important, right? So we got a lot of memory of, uh, improvement also, and 930 times over look ahead strategy. So we performed an equivalence checking of QC circuit uh, verification. If we found out it takes a few microseconds to finish our verification and our method performs really well. So then to conclude, so in this talk, we learned about various aspects of quantum circuit equivalence checking, why it is necessary and uh, what are the different approaches. We learned about various formal methods like decision diagram and zero cell class. We learned about simulation based verification where we looked at random and stimuli generation. Uh, we proposed a methodology for quantum circuit verification with QEC embeddings for decision diagram. Future research challenges can involve increasing the performance of formal verification methodologies with non equivalent circuits, use alternate quantum circuit simulation methodologies for more efficient simulation verification and reduce the search space for simulation based equivalence check checking that will reduce the time consumption while maintaining high fidelity okay so these are the challenges i think which are which we need to solve and again as i told you there are only a few papers on quantum circuit verification which i believe is a very very important challenge and people should take a look at it more seriously so that's all i have and thank you and i'm open to any questions right now